There are two readings this morning. The Old Testament reading is from 1 Kings chapter 19, starting at verse 1. If you have a church Bible, that's on page 361. Elijah flees to Horeb. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with a sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, may the gods deal with me be ever so severely if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the desert. He came to a broom tree, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the tree and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. He looked around and there by his head was a cake of bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time, touched him and said, Get up and eat for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he travelled for 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with a sword. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. Second reading is from Matthew, chapter 11, starting at verse 28. Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's just pray for Simon as he just comes and brings God's word to us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Simon. Thank you for the gifts that you've given him. Thank you for that you've been speaking to him as he's been exploring your word and looking into this passage. And we pray that you would anoint him now by your spirit um, to speak your word to us. And we pray that we wouldn't just be hearers, but we'd also be doers of your words. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, Josh. Morning, everybody. If you've got a Bible, if you couldn't mind, open it at 1 Kings chapter 19. Um, and then I'll speak for a few seconds to enable you to find it, because it's quite difficult, isn't it? It's quite near the beginning. But if you don't want to, that's fine. But it might be easier for you. I'm just going to move this over here a bit. Okay. It's like something's happened here this morning, isn't it? It's like, oh, it's not really weird. Like, there's nobody in this whole section of the church. I don't know why. Um, it's really, really hard listening to the notices this morning, looking around the church and seeing people who are clearly um, understandably upset by the loss of some Christian brothers and sisters recently. And uh, it's my privilege this morning to talk about one of those passages in the Bible where 
one of God's people was pretty low. And we're, we're going to see what the Bible says about um, uh, one of the Bible prophets, Elijah. So if you could, having dropped my Bible on the floor, I've lost the page. Um, if you could just turn to 1 Kings chapter 19, that might help you. I always think it's really useful that people can see what the Bible says rather than just kind of assuming that Simon's telling the truth because it's not guaranteed. <sighs> so this morning we're going to talk about Elijah. And we're going to talk about standing up for God and being down and keeping going. So standing up, being down and keeping going. Before I talk about Elijah, I just want to speak for a few minutes about myself, because I like doing that, but just briefly, um, a little bit of my story, because everyone loves a story, don't they? So, um, most of you will know I've worked for the ambulance service in the NHS for about 30 years. Um, (laughs) Amazingly, for those who know me, I've not really had any complaints during that time. Um, And then... Two years ago, I had a meeting with my line manager, and completely out of the blue, my line manager said to me that he'd received a formal allegation about me, and that it would need to be fully investigated, and that with immediate effect, I'd been suspended. Um, I I went home, as you do, um, and to be frank, wondered if I'd ever return um, after 30 years, and... How will I ever restore my reputation? This morning we're looking at Elijah. As I say, we're looking at his part of his story where he stands up for God and then we find him being down and then we see how he keeps going. But what do we know broadly about Elijah? Well, we know that Elijah's name means Yahweh is my God. Yahweh, the Old Testament Hebrew word for the one true God. Yahweh is my God. He appears really suddenly in the Bible at the end of 1 Kings. He disappears uh, not that many chapters later at the beginning of 2 Kings when God sends this fiery chariot and he, and he whips him off before he dies. He was a prophet, a man of God. You find him peppered through the Bible um, going on from there and into the New Testament where he's one of the characters that appears with Jesus. On the cross, someone says, "Shall we? let's see if Elijah comes to rescue him. In James, he says that Elijah was a man like us. So he's a big character throughout the Bible. When he lived, it was about 6 BC, uh, and they were bad times. Uh, There was a bad king, Ahab, and his queen Jezebel. And the main reason it was so bad is because they promoted Baal worship, highly sexualized, idolatrous worship of this fake god. And Jezebel and Ahab made it their business to try and eliminate the one true God. And Elijah was standing up. You see, if you've got a Bible, if you flick to 18, 1 Kings 18, 21, Elijah says, how long will you waver? How long will you dither and waver between the one true God and all the other pretend God, the fake gods that are out there, the fake spirituality. How long will you flip-flap around? It was time for Elijah to stand up, and the first challenge for us this morning, I think, is, is it time for us to stand up? Uh, well, I'm not aware of any Baal worship in Rushton today, but what I can see is that God is marginalised, I can see that God is kind of allowed to exist within the terms of society. As long as you change some of the Bible, as long as you make God a little bit different to how he describes himself, as long as you sanitize and soften it, then society says we can kind of live with that kind of God. We'll we'll permit him to be here. But that's not the God of the Bible. And then in chapter 18, there's a well-known chapter um, on, the Mount, on Mount Carmel, where Elijah challenges the prophets of Baal to this, this test of bringing down fire from heaven. Those of you who have been here f- a few years will know the great fire of 2019 at Whitefriars, when Chris Meisen tried to set fire to the building and everybody had to go out. I shall ever be really disappointed because we were on holiday at the time, but we were in Romania, we found out with it a, a couple of picoseconds and, and we were aware on social media. But the actual original event wasn't in Whitefriars. It was on Mount Carmel uh, in 6 BC. 
And Elijah challenges the king and queen and their 450 prophets to a competition and said, let's see, let's see who's the real God, who's the real deal here. And he says, what we'll do is you can try and call down fire from heaven, then I'll try and call down fire from heaven from my God and we'll see which of our sacrifices is consumed. Completely ridiculous, it sounds like, doesn't it? And all of Baal's 450 prophets, they spent all morning until evening slashing themselves with swords and chanting and calling out. And of course, their fake God didn't produce any fire because made up statues of gods and fake spirituality doesn't do anything. And then Elijah says, okay, my turn. Now, I think Elijah was a bit of a dra- dramatist. Anybody who's got kids, particularly teenagers, you'll understand this. So he's not content to just pray for fire. He wants to make it more difficult. Did you see Britain's Got Talent last weekend? There's a guy on there doing the Rubik's Cube. But to make it more difficult, he set fire to himself. Right? And that's what Elijah's doing here. Before he get, calls down the fire on the wood, he drenches it in water. So you guys can't have spent all day trying to get your false gods to call that fire down. We're going to, I'm going to drench this in fire and then we'll see what happens. And he prays to his God and the fire descends and consumes the sacrifice. And guess what? All the people he was challenging, they all turn around and cry out, Yahweh is our God. Because they've seen the power of the one true God. The last, next bit's a little bit gory. Elijah turns around and he kills all the false prophets. He wipes them off the face of the earth. Well, back at the palace, things are not going great. They're not too happy. You can see in the first two verses of the section that Richard read for us in 1 Kings 19, now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he'd killed all the prophets with the sword. And Jezebel says, as he's killed those prophets... So he will be killed as well, I paraphrase. And then something unexpected happens. And I love these bits about the Bible because it it shows you and demonstrates that the Bible's not a Hollywood story. The Bible's much more real than that because you would never have made this up. The unexpected happens next. In that uh, Elijah, he runs away. I've got to find my notes. After the spectacular public success on Mount Carmel and then slaying all God's enemy prophets, he gets threatened by Jezebel. And yeah, it's understandable. They've just signed his death warrant. But despite everything that just happens, he runs away. You can see it for yourself if you look down the passage in verse 3. Elijah was afraid and he ran for his life. A bit further down. Uh, When he came to Beersheba, he left his servant there. So it sounds like he got one person with him. He left him there. Probably not a great idea when you're struggling. Um, He goes uh, for a day's journey beyond. He gets as far away from their reach as he can. He gets to a broom, a broom bush somewhere in the wilderness, somewhere like Rawns, I'm imagining. And he sits down under the bush and he says, I want to die. I've had enough. Take me now. If you look down at verse 10, he says, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars and put your prophets to death with a sword. I'm the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. You can hear the desperation in his voice. Now, some of the things he says there are not entirely accurate. He wasn't the only one left, but that's how it feels sometimes, isn't it? Sometimes it doesn't, it's not logical. Sometimes it is overwhelming. Sometimes it feels like the odds are beyond anything that you can bear any longer. And he sits down under a bush in the wilderness and he wishes he was dead. So we've looked at Elijah standing up, but now we're looking at the reality of Elijah being down. He was scared, wasn't he? And understandably. There was a real threat. The palace had written his death warrant. He was exhausted, I guess. But let's be honest, he's had a busy couple of days, hasn't he? He spent the whole day on Mount Carmel, teasing and taunting, 
um, these 450 prophets in some great spectacle. I imagine that's quite exhausting. He's then killed 450 people. I don't know, I think that's pretty exhausting too. He then realises a death warrant's been issued for him. He runs as hard and fast, as long as he can, for more than a whole day's journey, it sounds like. He's probably physically absolutely exhausted. And now he's at rock bottom, a sort of slump of despair. He's not so much a Hollywood hero now. And sometimes the great warriors in the Bible are, are in that emotional slump. Was he depressed? Probably. Was he suicidal? It sounds like it. It sounds like he was at the bottom of his world. Is, is that okay for a Christian who's believing in the one true God? Yeah, of course it is. I mean, it's not aspirational. It's not, we're not trying to sell this as an ideal picture. But it is real. It's more real for some than others. It's not in my experience, and I'm, I can only really talk about my experience, and it's not for me to stand here this morning and talk and teach you about depression, because there are other people here who can do that much better than me. But I can recognise the reality of this situation for believers like Elijah. And it's not only Elijah. You see it in some of the other great Christian leaders, and uh, faith leaders in the Bible as well. Old Testament and New Testament. King David, uh, very clearly in lots of his Psalms, found himself in difficult situations. Take a look at Psalm 42, for example. You can see there he's crying out for God. He's even in some kind of a, a spiritual dehydration, it sounds like, in the middle of his particular storm. It's normal for some believers, to be in this place. And you know, I know we're called on to be gracious, but it really annoys me when some Christians say that depression and anxiety are symptoms of a godless society. I know what they mean when they say that. I get it. But what they're really saying is that means that Christians shouldn't be depressed or low. And that's a false gospel. That is the health and wealth gospel, and that is not Jesus gospel when we talk about and present Christianity as being something where we're kind of floating above reality on a health and wealth tra-la-la sort of world well we're probably presenting a false view of ourselves when we say that the Bible is much much more real than that you see God doesn't always promise to rescue us out of trouble does he one of my favourite books when we used to look after, look after little ones was a book called We're Going on a Bear Hunt. We're going on a bear hunt. We're going to, let's say we're going to catch a big one. I'm not sure we'd probably write a book these days about catching and killing bears, but bear with me. We're going on a bear hunt. We're going to catch it, wherever it was, big one, I don't know. And then there's a kind of a refrain. They come to different sorts of terrain. There's some long grass and a lake and a forest. And, and the refrain is something like, it, it, it goes... What are we going to do? How are we going to get around the obstacle? We can't go over it. We can't go round it. We can't go under it. We're going to have to go through it. And for some believers, they have to go through the darkest places. Elijah did. Here. David did. And many do. It doesn't make them any less loved by God or less faithful or less useful. Look how useful Elijah and David were. Look how the Bible talks about these men. So we've talked about standing up for God. We've talked about being down, even with God. And then finally, talking about keeping going with God. I think for me, the most interesting verse in this section of 1 Kings 19 is verse 4. So, Elijah is terrified and exhausted. He's run for ages. He's hiding. He's getting away from everything. He's at the bottom of his barrel. But in verse 4, what does he do? He sat down under the tree and he prayed. Yes, he prays that he might die. He complains about the situation he's in. But who does he talk to? He prays to God. And often when we're in difficult situations, we make a choice. We either push God away or we pull in close. 
And when we're lowest or most challenged, we sometimes find out what our relationship with Jesus is like. When we're really up against it, are we independence-focused, and self-sufficiency-focused, and not needing Jesus, or do we find that all we've got left is to turn to him? Now, in my story, it wasn't as dramatic or as terrifying as Elijah's. There weren't any prophets, there were no slashing with swords, there was no fiery chariot at the end, not yet anyway. Um, but in the first few weeks and months at home of my isolation and trying to come to terms with what was going on with me, I did lots of talking to God, because I didn't really know what else to do. I spent ages, I found new ways of praying. I kind of speak, talking for ages to God, wandering around the house, up the garden, around the fields, all kinds of things, and saying to God, why? What, what's going on, Lord? What is this all about? What is going on? Who is going on? Why is it going on? What is the point of all this? Where, how is this useful? How is this going to help you um, being seen through me and me being a good witness in my life? What is the point of all this? And then after a few months, this is my experience, I realized that actually none of those are the big thing. Because actually I couldn't do anything about any of them. That's not to say that it's a bad thing to try and understand things. It's natural, isn't it? God wants you to use your brain, do what you can to sort problems out, present God well, be an ambassador for him as best you can. But I realized that I couldn't change the complaint or the complainant. I couldn't make the decisions that needed to be made. I couldn't establish what the outcome would be or bring about the outcome. I couldn't do anything in that scenario to change my reputation in that moment. And I realized that I was powerless and completely reliant on God. And I found that I needed to just give it up to him. There's no point in worrying, I still did. But there's no point, it doesn't change anything. I got to the point where she said, Lord, you have it. Because I can't deal with it. I can't do anything about it. And you know, Jesus is not a bad person to turn to. For a number of reasons. Number one, he already knows. So there are no surprises for God. When you go to God with your problem and your desperation, he doesn't go, hang on a minute, it's been busy. Let me just check my social media because I need to catch up. He already knows everything that's going on in your world. Number two, he's all powerful. When you want to go to somebody who can change things and do things and make things the best, the perfect way they can be, he has no limits to his power. If you want somebody powerful, where else would you go? Number three, he understands, he gets it. Because Jesus has been there, wherever you are or have been or will be in the future. Jesus has been in the Garden of Gethsemane just before he went to the cross, asking his disciples to just stay awake and pray for a bit. And he comes back and they'd all gone to sleep. And at that moment, he must have known that even the people he'd spent all of his adult life with just couldn't even stay awake at his most needy moment. And think about how abandoned he felt on the cross. We've just had Easter a few weeks ago. Just think about how he must have felt. And we hear him crying out in his last desperate moment, Father, why have you forsaken me? He gets it. Whatever you're going through, he's been there and worse. And then finally, he's the right person to come to you because he loves you unconditionally. Look at verse 5 and following. Even though Elijah has probably not been the Hollywood role model that you'd, you'd expect, look how God deals with him. Even though Elijah's crying out and saying, I'm the only one left, Lord, which isn't true. And he's saying, oh, I've had enough, Lord, I just want to die, which isn't God's plan. Even though all of that is going on, God um, in verse 5, sends an angel. The angel touches him. Get up, he provides him food. He provides him a, a cake of bread over hot coals. I've never had that experience. But he provides for his needs. He sends him a jar of water. He revives him. The angel come back, comes back again. He talks to him. He encourages him. He strengthens him. He builds him up. He restores him. 
and he sends him back out when he's ready to go. God loves us and deals with us unconditionally. And if you've not known, found out about, or understood about a God who cuts through all the things that you and I can't manage, that we can't deal with, that we can't change, then I would implore you to come and find out and seek this God, the only God. Yahweh is my God and our God, the only God who can do these things. So in summary... This part of Elijah's story reminds us that we're fragile. There are lots you can't do. But that God is good. That we're called to stand up. Is it time for us to stand up a bit more? I think it is. We're reminded that sometimes, and for some people particularly, the Christian life includes being really down. And actually that's okay because God can use us there. And then finally, there are all times we need to keep going with God. As God takes you through life's tough times like he did Elijah, no matter how low you get, how much despair you experience, as you draw closer to him, I think you will experience the depths of his unconditional love. You will experience release from trying to fix all those things that you can't and experiences care and provision to keep going. And over all those things, my prayer is that you will be reminded and know that whatever comes your way, that God has a plan and he's working it out in your life. Thank you.